2021 VBS, which is coming up, and you'll hear more about that in a couple weeks. And be thinking about joining. We just got in a shipment today of vests that the kids are going to wear, as well as like safari hats. I didn't let you know that. It's two boxes sitting at my house. I didn't bring them over, but they're here. Decorations are here. We're excited about Vacation Bible School and, uh, and what God's going to do. Let's stand together and sing, What a Mighty God We Serve. <laughs> Thank you for the chance to fellowship with one another, to sing praises to you. We thank you for your word that instructs us and guides us and tells us of your plan for the ages and for each man and woman. We thank you for the power of your spirit that guides us and uh, comforts us, corrects us. And we pray, Lord, that as we yield ourselves to you, to your word and to your spirit, that we might walk in such a way that brings honor and glory to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Welcome to our service today. Tonight we have a, a short quarterly business meeting. Um, it's kind of important. Uh, we're going to review the, um, the bathroom remodeling project. And we need to approve some additional expenditures. We had an approval of a certain amount for that project and we thought it might run over and it did so we need to approve that extra amount so that we can pay um, for the cost of that remodeling project so that's going to happen tonight quarterly meeting depending on how long that goes we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of our reopening considerations that we've talked about and uh, we'll bring that up in our conversation as well and uh, we should have time in the word of God as well tonight there's a membership class that is happening during the second service and so uh, if you're planning to be part of that, of course, stick around. Don Miller's leading that during the second service. If you've thought about membership and you just want to hear a little bit more about it, feel free to stay in that second hour, and uh, it'll be down in the hallway. They'll be meeting. Children's Church again is uh, again today. After we do the kids' little message up here, there'll be Children's Church today. And uh, I think that's about it. Awana is going strong, and uh, they're – closing will be in like a month, right? May 10th. May 10th is the closing of Awana. 
And it's starting around that exact same time is Angel Closet. It's going to run two weekends, and uh, they're going to start the setup over a week before. And so if you want to be part of the Angel Closet ministry, there's probably be a sign-up soon to sign up to help either with the setup and that or also to help in the times when it's actually open and neighbors and friends are coming in for clothing. So our call to worship comes out of Matthew chapter 21. It's verse 9. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Um, our considerations in Revelation has been the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the King of Kings, to open the seals and to bring the plan of judgment to the world. And we'll consider that this morning. Let's continue to sing, though, as we sing about giving praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
6, Revelation chapter 6, the first four verses. Let me invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Revelation 6, verses 1 through 4. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He was sat on it, had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. In the opening of these two seals, we find two people rising, one who comes to bring peace, one who comes who eliminates peace on the earth, and God gives us a glimpse into what is man's future and yet, the only peace that comes, comes from Jesus Christ, who is the King. Let's sing together, Hosanna, you're the King. Father, we do give praise to your son, Jesus Christ, who is the king. The world is a better place because he came. We are better people because we've embraced his life, death, and resurrection. And may his spirit that abides within us give us the ability to bring a better world to the people we meet day to day. We give all our praise to you, to your son, and to his spirit. We pray in Jesus' name name. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. We'll meet up here with the kids and talk about fire for a few moments. What kinds of danger do you face? What kind of dangerous kids do you face? Give me some things you face as danger. Nothing? Your parents keep you so locked up you don't face any danger? You do. What? What kind of danger? What kind of things are dangerous to you? Getting poked in the eye with a stick, okay. Getting poked in the eye with a stick is a danger. 
trying not to fall, camping on, uh, what were you, riding a bike, rollerblading, scootering, so anything with wheels? What's that? Standing on the table? That's for, does your parents have a rule about not standing on the table? Do they have to have a rule about not standing on the table? No, do they? Um, uh, how many of you have ever seen the, the gate parents put up? You know what I'm talking about, the gate? Why do they put gates up in your house? Okay, so the kids don't go up the stairs or fall down the stairs. Yeah, keep you out of places. Any of you have at your house locked cupboards? Cupboards that you can't open, you can't pull the door open? They used to make these little plastic locks that only adults could open. You don't know what? You, you have two of them, right? You can open your cupboards? How many of you ever seen one of these? Hey, there's nothing in this. Is it, is it empty? You know how to open it? They make these so that you can't open them. And you don't, you have to press. So you guys all know how to open dangerous drug bottles. Wow. And so, so you guys, you guys aren't very safe. Um, you know, how many of you have to wear a helmet when you ride a bike? You know, they didn't have helmets when I was a kid. When I was a kid, they didn't have seat belts in cars. How would you like to ride around the back of a pickup truck? Yeah, they don't let you do that anymore, do they? Yeah, ride around the back of a pickup truck. They used to actually make seats that sat in the back of the pickup truck, and you could sit in them and ride around in the back. Wouldn't it be great? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, back then, back then, back way in the history when life wasn't quite as safe, but now you're all really safe. I brought some matches with me in a moment. I'm going to light one. Okay, yeah. Look at some of these kids are really excited. Okay, so let me tell you this. So the world gives you all sorts of rules to keep you safe, right? So there's three friends that Daniel want to tell you about in a moment how God kept them safe. Their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they were three friends of Daniel, and they had moved to Babylon because they thought it'd be a better place to live, right? They were taken as prisoners to Babylon. So they were young, a little older than you, and they were ripped away from their parents. And like if you were ripped away from your parents and sent to another place where they spoke a different language, and they ate different foods, and they worshiped different gods, you didn't go to church, and one day the king built a golden statue. I think I have a picture of this. So the king built a golden statue, and he said to everybody who was in the country, when you hear the music play, or the guy on the drums beat the drums, then you have to bow down and worship the golden statue. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been raised a little differently. They were raised a little bit like you. They had heard there was Ten Commandments. And you know what the first three commandments of the Ten Commandments are? Yes, don't have any other gods, don't make any carved images, and don't bow down to them. They had three rules that said, if you want to be safe, obey God. And so they said, we will not bow. And the king didn't like it, because here's what the king said. If you don't bow, you will? You'll burn. So I brought matches with me today. I'm going to burn something. Hold on. There we go. So the three boys were thrown into a fiery furnace. They burned so hot that the guys who threw them in died from the heat. No, I'm not going to put it on something. You guys are terrible. Now hold on, hold on. So they went into the fiery furnace, and God protected them, and they came out. Now here's the most important part. Can you smell it? Can you smell it? What's it smell like? Burning wood? You ever had a campfire? Okay, here's what the Bible says. They came out of the fire and didn't even smell like smoke. God protected them because they obeyed him. If you obey your parents about certain rules that protect you, you'll be protected. If you decide to disobey them, 
then maybe you'll get into a little bit of trouble. Here's what I want you to remember. God takes care of us and protects us when we obey him. If you've been listening to Sunday School, yesterday I started a new Sunday School series on judges. The nation of Israel didn't want to obey God, and they got in trouble, and then they would say, God, help me, God, help me. <laughs> and God would send them someone like Samson, like Gideon. And this coming week, we're going to talk about a guy you've probably not really heard about. His name is Othniel, who's going to help the nation of Israel. Okay, so if you guys are going to junior church, children's church, you can go. If you're going back to sit with your families, you can do that. If you're going to nursery, you can go as well. The only fiery thing mentioned in Revelation chapter 6, the first four verses, was the fiery red horse. But I want to ask you a question. If you knew the future, if you knew the next 20 years, the next 10 to 20 years, if you knew who was going to be the next world leader, over the next 10 to 20 years, who's going to be the next world leader? Who's going to be the next person who's going to rise up and the world is going to consider them the most important the most significant world leader, if you knew who that was, if you knew which nation in the next 10 to 20 years would rise to be supreme militarily. Now, you might have some ideas. Oh, in the next 20 years, it's got to be either A, B, C. But if you knew that, if you knew which natural resources were going to become scarce, like lithium or helium, I remember back in the 70s when we were going to run out of oil. I don't know if you remember the 70s, some of you. We were going to run out of oil. There wasn't enough oil in the world. Then they kept finding more, kept finding more. But if you knew in the next 20 years what natural resource would be scarce, we'd be close to running out. If you knew what natural disasters were going to occur. I mean, they just had, uh, they just had another, there was just another volcano. I, I saw it yesterday. Now I can't remember where it was, but a volcano blew. And uh, not, not huge, but there was also a 5.5 earthquake in Anchorage a week ago. And I saw that on Facebook by my, my sister-in-law. says, yes, we had a 5.5 earthquake in Anchorage. You know when the next natural disaster was going to occur? Let's say it was going to occur in Hawaii in 11 years in November. Would you visit Hawaii in 11 years in November? I mean, if you knew. If you knew which next health crisis was going to arise. If you knew what the next health crisis was going to be over the next 10 to 20 years, would you feel more prepared or less? If you knew any of those things, would you feel more prepared or less? Wow, I know what's coming. I'm ready for it. I know which natural disaster is coming. I know what hurricane, what blizzard. I know what's going to run out. There's not going to be any more lithium batteries because they're not going to find any more lithium or there's not going to be any more oil, oil. So I'm going to have to figure a new way to heat my home. Would you feel more prepared or less? Would you be more confident if you knew? Or would you be more unsure? Would knowing the future help? Would you be able to establish a path? Okay, I know what's going to happen in the future, so I'm going to establish a path, and I'm going to boldly follow that path because I know where this is going. I know how this is going to end up. Or would you still question every step? I mean, I know what's going to happen, but what should I do? Does knowledge of the final outcome give us strength to remain faithful now? Since we know how it's going to turn out at the end, I can be strong and faithful now. Since I know how God is going to wrap everything up, I can follow God now because I know how he's going to finish this thing. That's what Revelation is kind of about. How does God finish it all, and can I then be, be bold and confident because I know how he's going to finish it? Or will I still, knowing the future, will I still try to adjust each moment so this last week, I got a letter from the Social Security Department. I tried a couple weeks ago to get into my Social Security account to look up where I'm at in Social Security, and I didn't know my password because I'd set it up years ago. So they had to send me a new, car, a new code, and I opened the mail, and here it was. So I rushed over to my office, got on ssa.gov, 
put in the code, and I looked up my future, and it looks good. Though they said in 2020, I only made $17,000, which isn't quite true. And it says in 1984 and 85, I made zero. Now, I had two kids at the time, and I was married. I believe I worked. But anyway, they say I didn't make any money those two years. But I was looking at my benefits in 20, let's see, when I'm 70, which will be like 2031, 2032, I'm going to be okay. So I don't need to save any more money. Because I know the government and you younger taxpayers will be there to support me in the lifestyle that I deserve, that I have earned, that is, that is established in electronic stone for me. At the bottom of the page, they say, things can change due to changes in the law. <laughs> There's a little disclaimer there on the page that says, what you think is a sure thing may not be. So here's the question for you today. How are you holding up to life right now? How are you holding up right now to life? There's a few things I thought that might be impacting us. Do you sometimes feel overwhelmed by responsibility? I mean, you know, responsibility, things going on. Are you unsure? if you're going to have sufficient resources to meet your obligations this month, let alone next or the one after? Are you fearful that if the world gets any more crazy, you might, you might think less about God or feel more unsure about this plan God has when the world seems to be bound and determined to destroy itself? Do we think that we have what it takes to remain faithful to God? Do you have right now what it takes to be faithful to God? Do we even know what that means? What does it mean to be faithful to God? I mean, you could set up a series of rights and wrongs, right? Go to church, read my Bible, and pray. Well, what does it mean about what I do with my money? What does it mean about what, how I treat the people in my family? And what does it mean about how I approach my boss at work? And what does it mean to remain faithful? Do you sometimes feel you're being asked to surrender your rights to an ever-changing world? You know, if you spend enough time in social media, you can find yourself getting antsy and angry. You can find yourself saying, I don't get it, and wondering why the world is changing so rapidly. Does the motto, live and let live, seem to be a slide in our society? Well, let's just let everybody live and let live. But, you know, that might sound like it doesn't affect anybody, but if everybody just lives the way they want to live, do you know that was described a couple places in the Bible, people who lived the way they wanted to live? It was called the time of Noah and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, where people lived the way they wanted to live. Live and let live. Do you feel sometimes you're pressured to compromise? So I got poison ivy a couple weeks ago, at least I believe that's what it is. And my arm is almost healed, but the rest of my body is quite bad. I basically laid down all day yesterday and couldn't function, and, and it's quite bad. And here's, what, here's my conspiracy theory. I got the COVID vaccine. I got the COVID vaccine. I got my two shots over the last three weeks, and it made my body more susceptible to those vines of, of poison ivy I ripped down from Julia's house that has infected my whole body, and I would not be this sick if I didn't get the COVID vaccine. Because I saw a post on Facebook that said there's all these reactions to the COVID. None of them are like poison ivy, but doesn't matter. I can adjust it to fit my needs. See, do we sometimes walk through life and look for, you know, if I just hadn't gotten the vaccine, I would be less miserable right in this moment. I have a stool there in case I eventually need to sit because of just feeling wiped out. 
Maybe that's the answer. Are we ready to embrace what Jesus said about what it meant to be a follower of him? Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12 say this. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I heard a little bit of a blurb this morning on, on social media. A guy I listen to regularly who has a conservative talk show. And the statement that jumped out at me in this three or four minute diatribe he was going on, he's always really talking about how why he as a conservative is continually attacked and continually lied about. And here's what he said. But when I pray to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I know he is there for me. So here's a man who's declaring publicly in his very public forum his commitment to Jesus Christ, and he might be saying, why, are, why am I being attacked? Well, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 says, you are blessed if, because you are seeking righteousness, because you are pursuing the kingdom of God, you are blessed if people are attacking you and you are persecuted. That's actually a positive thing. He goes on to say, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Jesus says, look, if you're going to follow me, just understand that there's going to be a segment of the culture, a segment of the world, maybe people you know, maybe people you thought were your friends, who are all of a sudden going to turn against you in a very verbal way. With slander and libel and lies and misrepresentations and say all sorts of evil things. Saw an interesting thing the other day. There was a complaint being made that certain members of the media were making fun of our president because he seems to be less than, less than stable on his feet. Let's put it that way. I remember when, when President Ford, who became president when Nixon resigned, fell and tripped a couple of times. They couldn't get enough of that. If there had been social media back then, in the 70s, you'd have seen President Ford falling on his face. You know, it had been a million times. It had gotten so many hits. So they were making fun. They were, they were upset that people had made fun of our present president who, guess what? How many of you haven't tripped? How would you like that to be videotaped? And if you tripped, wouldn't you then, like, pop up and act like it didn't happen? Of course you would. What happened to our president is just a natural thing. It's no big deal. But they're upset that people are making fun of him, and then this other person said, yeah, but the last president, you hounded him every day for four years. See, do you sometimes feel like, how will I handle if people make me the target? Well, here's what he says. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Not here, but great is your reward in heaven. Well, how does that help us today? So the question is, are we ready to see what God will do? Are we ready to see what God is going to do? Do we really want to know what God is going to do? Do we want to know the future? Do we want to see how it will all end? Or would we prefer, one of the reasons I looked up socialsecurity.gov, would we prefer some prosperity, some success, and maybe a quiet retirement? My favorite place in the world is Cabo, Mexico, San Jose del Cabo. And last night, as I couldn't sleep, I got onto YouTube, and I watched five videos from this woman who is living right now in San Jose del Cabo and rented an apartment right downtown, and I'm watching all these places that I was just there a couple years ago, and I'm going, and she's talking about how quiet it is and how comfortable it is and how affordable it is, and I'm sitting there, and I'm going, oh, a quiet retirement. And then I'm realizing as I get old and more uh, and I'm deteriorating rapidly. I don't know about you, but I'm deteriorating rapidly, at least in my own eyes. I'm going, how quiet is it going to be when I'm taking 22 different medications, dragging my oxygen bottle? I better just be thankful for what things are right now. Someone said, oh, it's raining. I says, good, my grass will grow. It's not a bad thing. So Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1 says this. What will the future look like? Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, come and see. As the scroll is open, John is going to gaze into the future. The characters and the events, these are not John's contemporaries. He is not seeing his present world. There is no indication 
that John will experience any of these events he's going to see. He's not being told, prepare yourself, John. You're going to live through this. He's not being told that. He's being given a glimpse into the future that is not his future. Not his specific future. Nevertheless, what he's going to see is real. It is terrible. And it is designed, it is purposed to drive John to God. Revelation chapter 6, verse 2 says this. So he looked, I looked, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow. He had a crown that was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. So the first seal is this conqueror arises. A conqueror arises. And it's unique, this phrase, come and see. When we read this phrase, come and see, it's kind of a difficult phrase. You might say, he's telling us to come and see this writer. It's exactly the opposite of that. The picture here is the angel is telling the writer to enter the amphitheater where the crowds have been waiting and to present himself. Come and see the world that's about to see you. That's what the phrase is declaring. So the picture here is there's a great crowd, which would be the world population, gathered in a great amphitheater, and riding through the gate is the conqueror who arises. And he rides into the middle of them, and they see him for who he is. So he rides on a white horse. The white horse is the picture that he is the victor. He's the conqueror. That's the context of John's day. That's what John understood. What does he carry with him? A bow. But it's a bow without an arrow. He's just carrying a bow. It's like carrying a gun without ammunition. He's victorious, but he's won without any war. He's subdued the world without bloodshed. He rides in as one who has been lifted up to be their leader. And a crown was given to him. He doesn't snatch the crown from another king. He doesn't defeat. We find that later in the book of Revelation, where kings rise up and defeat and for war and fight with other kings. This man rises up, and people just give him the authority and the power to rule. It's a political victory, if you want to put it in those terms. It's a crisis victory. There's a crisis. There's upheaval. And this man is raised up to be the one who will solve their problems. The one who will lift them out of their drudgery. Before 2020, would we have imagined a world conquered without war? 2020 has shown us that the world can be conquered without war. The world can be conquered by the power of fear. Have we noticed that few people have made rules for everyone that go far beyond rules we've ever, willingly, ever accepted? I mean, seriously. We've accepted rules that never would have been accepted 10 years ago out of fear. We've seen the impact of a single global message that has shut down all dissent. We watch Europe right now shutting down again. I saw a stat the other day that in 2019 there were 38 million cases of the flu in America. Do you know how many cases there were in 2020? 1,800. I don't know. I don't know if you could believe that. But we have seen a society changed, personal behavior radically modified, and the world still holds its breath. But we're not seeing the conqueror. What we've seen in the last year is that you can conquer, you can gain the support of the world without bloodshed, without warfare. But the conqueror here is going to be the one man who rises. 
you probably can't identify a single individual because it's not happened. There's not a single person who the world is acknowledging as the answer. In fact, as one person rises to a level of prominence, someone else knocks them down and someone else rises. I mean, we keep watching that. That is the politics of the world, right? As quickly as one rises, the chorus shuts them down. There's been no single voice that has sounded that everyone has listened. But here in Revelation 6, one man will rise. One man will rise. He will conquer the world. And he'll be no friend to men and women of faith. We're not going to get to that in this message. But when we get to the fifth seal and the sixth seal, we find that this man is no friend of the Christian. So what will it take for the world to accept one man? What kind of crisis would it take? For the world to accept one man. We, we can't even estimate what it be. Could it be a, 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 a health crisis like we've seen? Could it be a financial crisis? Could it be an environmental crisis? We don't know. But we know that at a point in the future, one man will be able to rise up and everyone will clamor to him for the answers. Revelation chapter 6 verses 3 and 4 says, once this one is in control... Once the world has ceded their authority all to him, he says, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given him a great sword. So men will not give up violence, even though one will rise up to solve the immediate crisis, and the world will unify under one man, Man will not give up his participation in violent acts because war and conflict will arise. Though the conqueror wins without bloodshed, the world does not remain at peace. The picture here is a red horse of war, and he takes peace from the earth. How he does that? How have men taken peace from the earth now? As many ways as you can consider are things that have happened. And he causes man to kill one another. Notice, this is not a single army coming in and wreaking havoc. This is a person who's able to get other people to fight an arm. Now, we've seen some of that, right? Do you ever wonder who's behind the curtain when you see violent things happen, when you see uprisings, when you see, when you see riots? There's a big threat that riots are going to occur again if... Certain court cases don't go the right way. People are going to rise up. There's been threats. And you ever wonder who's behind it? Who's behind it? And, and people, conspiracy theorists will tell you, well, it's so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, I remember back years ago, there was a, what was it called? It was, uh, there's an organization of very wealthy people, and they have a certain name. And it was like in the 60s and the 70s. And President Bush, the first President Bush, he was a member of that. And it was this whole conspiracy thing. And a friend of mine gave me a book, and I read it. And I went, oh, that's interesting. You know, we want to know who's behind the curtain. Who's the one pulling the strings? You know, is it the richest men in the world? Is it the bankers? Is it the politicians? Is it the military? There's a lady on Facebook who, who, who uh, has a background in working with the military, and she has this belief that the military in America is going to rise up and bring order back to America. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? Who's behind it all? In Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, there is a person who rises up, probably different from the first. So the first man is on the throne, using man in a generic term, but most likely it is a male, because worldwide it's probably still going to be, if it was today, it would still be a male who would have to be. Maybe in 30, 40 years, a woman could be that. But one person is on the throne bringing peace, and someone else is under causing strife, upheaval, warfare, conflict. And he carries a sword that represents all of the death. So John, who is seeing this, he has seen his share of brutal world leaders. Now, his world is much smaller. His world is the Roman world, and he knew Nero. Nero destroyed parts of Rome and then blamed the Christians. After Nero was Domitian, and he hated the church so much that he killed thousands of its members. So, 
John has seen a world leader devastate groups of people. But the violence has not been limited just to Christians, has it, over the last 2,000 years? The peace between nations is often dependent on the men and the women who lead them, right? The peace between races and people groups is easily upset. It seems sometimes in our own culture right now that the, that the push is not for racial groups to get along, but for racial groups to hate each other more. It, it almost seems like that. That seems to be the world in which we're living. Is not get along, but actually have greater divides. Vicki was kidding me the other day when she said she's going to apply for reparations because she is related to the former czars of Russia. And she feels like they owe her something, having been a third fourth generation separated from the early czars of Russia that probably Russia owes her money for having overthrown her relatives. Seems legitimate. I'm not sure we're going to collect. I don't know what a ruple is worth. But maybe it'll go into my social security fund. We seem to be living in a world where everybody wants to blame someone else and the world seems to be encouraging that. Hitler declared that the Aryan nation was superior, the Aryan race. The Ayatollah called the West the great Satan. Louis Farrakhan, if some of you are familiar with him, he said Hitler was a great man. And then he said this, they call them terrorists, I call them freedom fighter, fighters. We've had people in our culture who think war and violence is the appropriate way to accomplish their ends. I read a statistic of the past 3,400 years of recorded history, it appears the world has been at peace for 268 out of 3,400 3, years. Out of 3,400 years of history, there's been 268 years of peace. My question would be, of those years of peace, do they really know what was going on in every corner of the world? In the 20th century, the 20th century, we're in the 21st now, in the 20th century, do you realize that 108 million people were killed in war? 108 million were killed in the 20th century in war. That'd be World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and all the other conflicts that went on. In 2020, in the United States, in our country last year, the homicide rate in Chicago rose 50%. It rose 40% in New York City and 30% in L.A. Are we less violent? Last year, 19,000 people in America were killed, which was the highest in 20 years. There was a 50% increase in mass shootings in America last year. A mass shooting is when four or more people are shot or, and or killed in a single incident. There were 600 mass shootings last year in America. But none of that can be put at the feet of one man. You can't. So we're not there. See, we've seen glimpses of the kind of things that John is seeing, but it's not the one that God is going to bring. Because he's going to bring one person who causes all of that kind of chaos in the world. Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. So when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. The third seal brings famine and want. Famine and want arise. With the rise in violence, with the rise in war, should we be surprised that the next thing to happen to the world would be a level of famine, a level of want. So this one who rides on a black horse, the black horse represents death. He carries scales to measure the resources. So what resources will there be for survival? And he only talks about survival. He talks about wheat and barley. He talks about the two basics. Wheat is for those who have more money. Barley is for those who have less money. Barley is cheaper and less nutritious than wheat. 
And that's the presentation. But this is survival. So famine and inflation creates this hardship. So here's what he describes. For a day's wage, that's a denarius, for a day's wage, a person can buy a day's worth of wheat for one person. So if you worked a whole day, you could buy for yourself enough wheat for you to survive that day. You couldn't buy for your spouse. You couldn't buy for your children. You could buy for you. Now, if you chose not to buy wheat and you chose to buy barley, you could buy three days' worth of barley for one person. So on a day's wage, you could buy enough barley for you for three days, or you could buy enough barley for you and two others for one day. On your day's wage. In John's day, he's looking at a cost that is 12 times the normal. Where a loaf of bread in today's dollars would be 36. So you could buy a loaf of bread for $36. Now you would say, well, I make much more money than that. Well, yes, because we are very wealthy Americans. We make well beyond day's wages, right? Most of the world makes a day's wage. Most of us make four or five or ten times a day's wage every day. Because we're wealthy. And he talks about the wealthy in this verse as well. But what he's describing here is a famine and inflation, which could be either natural as a result of the violence going on, or it could be artificially conceived or a result of war. Let me ask you this. Why is the price of wood so high? Well, there's several reasons they give you. They shut down the processing plants for months and months. So there was less supply. And people had time on their hands, so they wanted to build things. So there was more demand. And interest rates were low, so people wanted to buy houses and build houses, so the demand was up. So there's high demand, low productivity, and inflated prices. So here's the real question. I was talking to a builder at Camp Lamoca this last week. And I was talking to an engineer. We're working on the septic system for the new cabin and the idea of that. And they both work in this building industry, and they've been doing it for, for 30 years. And I said, so are prices going to come back down? And they both laughed. Once people get used to a certain price, there's no motivation to bring it back down. So see, in the day of famine, as described by John, maybe naturally it occurs. But then it is artificially kept in place to keep people suffering. The impact of this is partial, though, and not complete, right? There is food available at an inflated price. Some are going to suffer greatly, he describes. Some will actually die as a result of this famine. Some will die. Others will become impoverished. They will use all of their resources to buy food. But then there's some who will kind of go on life as normal. They'll still have oil. They'll still have wine. That would kind of be us, America, right? I mean, the world could be impoverished by many things. People could die as a result of famine and starvation, but not us. We'll still have Oreo cookies. Fresh orange juice. While the world suffers. But the impact of the first three writers is going to be world changing. Here's what John understands. Here's what's revealed to him when he looks at the fourth seal. This is world changing. The fourth writer is going to summarize all of the devastation. Revelation chapter 6, 7, and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over the fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger and with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The fourth seal, death encompasses the earth. That's kind of a summary of everything that's happened to this point. Yes, a conqueror comes in and he brings what appears to be peace. But the next one who arises brings people at discord with one another and war and violence and killing erupts. And then there's devastation of famine and inflation and starvation. And finally, when you get to the fourth seal, death rides in, followed by Hades, the place of the dead. And it says a fourth of the people on the earth will die. This has never been seen. The greatest plagues in history, which would have been the Black Death, 
that they say killed up to 30% of the European population, the Black Death did, 30%, is nothing because it was just Europe for the most part. When they talk about the pandemic of 1918 and the devastation that it brought, it's nothing compared to, in today's numbers, 2 billion died. Not 108 million who died the last century. The 20th century, 108 million died from war. 2 billion. A quarter of the world's population dies. And he describes a death scene in which they die by sword. There's violence, there's war, there's persecution. There is just, there is just uproar across the world. And then there is famine and plague, disease and starvation. Now when you encompass a world in which hundreds and thousands and millions die... There's not enough people to care for the dead. There's not enough place to put the dead. And what does he describe? The beasts of the earth rise up and kill more. If you remember back last fall, last fall, last spring, when the shutdown first occurred, after a month or two, they said they started seeing wildlife moving into areas of habitation that they normally wouldn't venture into because we were staying inside, because we were not going out. I remember last March and early April, driving down into Ithaca and the streets are empty and school is closed and businesses are closed and people are avoiding one another It was eerie. I remember coming home to Vicky and saying, this is strange. Imagine the terror in a world turned upside down. The pandemic that we have suffered has killed untold thousands. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine that half a million plus more people in our country died from what seems to be the flu. And worldwide, it's, it's so much bigger. But think about if you multiplied that by 10 or 20 or 100, you wouldn't think twice about wearing your mask in your house. We sometimes joke, maybe you don't, we sometimes joke if you're driving down the road and you see someone in their car alone wearing a mask. But if you don't believe in God, wouldn't you be scared? Wouldn't you wonder if something as silly as this could actually help? John sees a world that is turned upside down in fear, in devastation, where a conqueror comes with a single voice to say, I'm going to bring peace, and at the same time, the world is upended into violence and death. If we really thought about a world that got to that stage, where would we turn? I began this message with the idea, if you knew what was going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years, would you, would you change your choices? Would you adjust your path? Would you maximize the profitability and the success of your life? Well, if what we know is eventually this all goes to ruin in the judgment of God, should that not drive us? To the one who promises peace. To the one who promises blessing. Blessed are you, Matthew 5. Blessed are you if you pursue the kingdom of God. Blessed are you in the next life. 
and not the life that is here. We still want to be at ease here and now. And we cannot divorce ourselves from that. That is part of our human nature, part of our sinful nature, that we want it to be better now. We want life to go to whatever stage we like life to be, whether it's travel or work or see friends or enjoy one another's company. We want that. But God says, if I don't give you that, will you still remain faithful to me? One of the conversations we've been having is about how can we come back together as a single congregation at a single time on a Sunday to worship? And guess what? We're not there. We're not there. The world's not there, and we're not there. And you might not be there. And here's what we want you to understand. If one or two or three of you are driven to stay away because it feels like we're unsafe, then we're not going to be unsafe. And we're going to invite you to be here and feel safe to hear the word of God and to fellowship. Because guess what? Meeting here as a single group of believers is not as important as meeting there with God himself. It's not as important because God is on the throne. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be reminded that you look at the world through the eyes of justice and you will bring people to an understanding that you exist and that their only hope for peace, their only hope for security comes in you. Help us, Lord, not to demand from you the temporary nature of a convenient life. The transitory nature of comfort. Help us to want to be faithful to you so that people might see you in our lives and not us ourselves. Lord, we are faced with often such complicated situations that we don't know what is right or wrong in a particular decision, but you can continue to guide us and allow us to see our need to be servants to all, not to ourselves, not to our own desires, but to those around us. And to try and encourage them and uplift them and direct their attention to you. Because our only hope is found in your son, Jesus Christ, who faced all the rebuke and all the reviling and all the anger and all the hatred and from the cross said, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. Thank you that he took my sin, all of our sin, and thank you for the faith that you give us and for the strength you give us through your spirit to stand with you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.